afternoon, everyone. Welcome to another exciting episode of BWHR Voices. Today, we have uh, Ms. Ruhi Pandey with us from Godrej. Ruhi, we welcome you on board. It's a pleasure for us to be speaking with you. And, you know, it, it gives us immense pleasure and happiness that, you know, you took out time, especially for us to, you know, discuss on such an important topic that what can be overlooked in a women's CV. Considering that, you know, we are in such an important and exciting week of March, wherein we'll be celebrating the women's special on 8th of March. So, you know, we've decided to pick up certain issues and certain topics that are actually, um, you know, uh, you know, it is the talk of the town. We don't really discuss it at length every day, but it is something that is of a problem that, you know, women are facing in these times. So um, I gave a small introduction of what I feel about uh, this conversation and what exactly we'll be discussing. So women on an average, you know, they're 30% less likely to be called for a job interview than men with same characteristics. In addition, gender bias is higher for candidates with lower qualifications than those who have knowledge of an additional language and more experience. But there is another prevalent reason for such discriminations. Gaps in a women's CV in the name of maternity or sabbatical is, you know, counted as a hindrance when they try to reapply or restart their careers post uh, sabbatical or maternity. So my first question to you is why? Why, why do you see in 21st century today also we are facing this issue wherein um, let's say at leadership level also, we do see less number of women uh, while in a way of starting back the career, women are still in the place of facing hindrances while apart from maternity, I feel the reason for sabbatical can be similar for both men and women. But why only women yeah. face or bear the brand? Yeah, hi, Sugand. Very nice and happy to talk to you. And the theme of this year's Women's Day is embracing equity. And the question you've asked me is all about that. So there is a reality that diversity, equity and inclusion is both a long term and a day to day challenge, which uh, at least practitioners like me face. And this is a reality that when women are coming from sabbatical, there is generally genuinely a skepticism about hiring them back. And that comes due to many reasons. I mean, at the end of the day, managers who are hiring also have day to day challenges and pressure. So some of the reasons why I feel this uh, hesitation in hiring back women from who's coming back from a sabbatical can be multifold. Some of the reasons are henceforth. One, the pace of change in today's environment is very high. We've seen how, you know, how almost on an everyday basis changes are happening at the workplace and somewhere at the back of a hiring manager's mind is this con construct that will the women be able to manage this pace of change when they are coming back? The second challenge is that the managers are very cognizant of the fact that when a woman from a sabbatical is coming back, there is a transition which needs to be managed. There is an ongoing reality of the fact that the managers have to manage productivity as well. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, that's the third challenge which a manager faces in their mind that will the women who are transitioning back or coming back after a career break be willing to put in those additional amount of extra hours which is required course, for the productivity yeah. to be maintained, right? Uh, fourth is somewhere in the back of her mind, both the hiring manager as well as the HR person understands that the aspiration of the woman needs to be met. They've gone away from taking a sabbatical at a particular point of time and when they are going to come back into the workplace, a lot of their peers would have gone ahead. In that mm -hmm. scenario, how will their aspiration be managed, right? There is also a very strong overhang in the minds of all managers that a woman coming back from a sabbatical, and actually that's also a fact, will have work-life balance requirements. And will this job allow the manager to manage that reality? Because the manager has to manage productivity, the manager has to manage the woman's expectations of a work-life balance. Uh, to add to it the complexity of the competition in the marketplace, you know, there is a lot more younger and a far more tailor-made uh, proposition of candidates who's available in the market who, who are there. And when a manager looks at multiple CVs, there is a woman who's coming back from a sabbatical, there is a ready-made talent, younger, aspirational, far higher, far more ambitious, you know, who's there. Uh, the other challenge which often happens is women coming back from a sabbatical also face the challenge of ageism. Because in terms of age and stage, they would have taken a couple of years off and thereby they would be older than a lot of the population in the current roles and contexts. Right. How do you balance that? How do you manage that? 
add to it i'm i'm telling you the challenges and i'll also tell you how some of these can be circumvented pace of technology is so high that some of the softwares which people were working on are obsolete now and new technologies have come in so it's often at the back of a manager hiring managers mind that will the woman who's coming back be able to manage this complexity of technology will this uh, hinder them will they be able to adapt to this technology last but not the least the expectations of women returning to the workplace and often times we see that when they are returning to the workplace they come with their own biases they come with their own challenges and that thereby makes the hiring manager a little wary on how uh, should you even consider someone like that should i just go for a ready made talent fit and these are practical realities you know so gan i mean which we face on a day to day basis no of course uh, some of the ways in which we can circumvent this is uh one women who are coming back from a sabbatical themselves i think somewhere the hiring managers and the hr managers need to have an alignment discussion with them that things have moved and how is it that we can make these women far more prepared to come back into the workplace can we provide them some coaching can we provide them some mentoring can we provide them some ready made for skilling products can women themselves look at skilling themselves even before they start appearing in the interview process can they ask hiring managers what are the expectations can they be a little bit more flexible around their own mm. schedules right so that would be the entire second thing of what self efficacy and what agency the women can show um then the third question is will they be happy because when they went they were at a particular level now their peers might have moved ahead and they are of coming course. back so some sort of alignment with them saying you know you haven't really lost out and the organizations having discussions with women who are returning around career lattices saying when you come into our the workplace what kind of career could you have and all careers don't need to be vertical could there be a career lattice could there be rotational movements could there be horizontal movements which can be spoken to by the hiring managers by the hr to these women that would really help having a structured program around having women who are returning to workplace would be really of help because there are there are these realities of when women come back from sabbaticals they they themselves come with a lot of anxiety into the workplace saying will i be successful uh then having these maybe having some counselors around have uh, bringing them into the workplace smoothly having these conversations with them i think having a structured program talking to them to them about their career lattices last but not the least i would say nothing succeeds like success so making some role models around women who transition successfully talking right. about their success stories and at gc we've had a lot of people who have come back from sabbaticals uh women who came back after five odd years into the workplace and we made some success stories around them we talk or talk to people around how these women came back how they successfully assimilated so there could be challenges some women may not be successful but for every woman who is not successful there would be many who are so really making talking points to them making them into role models successfully talking about their career transitions having a very structured program i would say these would be some ways in which the organizations can circumvent very beautifully it. you've crafted you know the problems as well as solutions rohi uh to my understanding i also feel that companies today are heavily investing on these women who are coming back at work while you really said that you know you're making certain stories uh around them and you know helping them come back to work what kind of learning programs or induction programs you think you know companies should devise uh i mean it's not specific to one gender so you know even even a husband can take a sabbatical for let's say 6 months considering that you know his parents might need them and and the same amount and the same level of learnings as well as induction he would also require so how can organizations work towards a gender centric i mean a common uh, induction program or learning program for such uh, workers who coming back to work after taking a break i think it's a very relevant point because people when you're making these efforts to have career 2.0 programs mm-hmm. you have to ensure that you make efforts to make them successful so induction programs need to be devised by organizations learning programs need to be devised by organization there will be a lot of work around skilling Mm-hmm. so for example if there are technologies these people have not been exposed to how do you give them uh online programs to uh, attend and to make themselves abreast of the latest technologies how do you make them in hand, uh, aware about the structures which have changed what kind of organization structures do you have if there is a particular job which they are getting into having some very structured inductions about skill 
but also I would say it's equally important to sensitize them about the socializing them into the organization. That is a very important part, which I think sometimes organizations fail at because induction is both hard and soft skills. Of course. So socializing them into your culture, your values, the ethos of the organization, maybe having some mentors or counselors available from them. In fact, a lot of organizations, and we also do that when women return from maternity, they come with a very heightened amount of anxiety about coming back to the world. What all they have missed, missed, right? What all they have missed. And there is a lot they have missed. And I, like I was saying earlier, the pace of change is so high that six months in itself seems like a long time. So when these women come back, having counselors available to them to talk through their anxieties, having HR people available to them, to socialize them in the organizations, to give them maybe mentors in the company who can mentor them, who can talk through some, you know, uh, having some sounding boards, who can talk through some day-to-day challenges which they have. Mm -hmm. So induction programs could also include uh, if women are facing, if men and women both who are returning from a sabbatical are facing certain challenges, who can they go to? Who can be their sounding board? Because oftentimes in a large organizations, people don't have time. Everyone is busy with their own thing. In that, is there a sounding board they can go to and ask simple questions like, you know, I'm facing challenges with my boss. How should I approach this? I don't know who to go to in the organization for X, Y, Z work. My system is not working. Can they create some sounding board? And technology can help there because AIs can be used to create tools which can listen in and give proactive feedback to the organization from this returning. Very valid point. Proactively reaching out to them to understand that how have your first 30 days been? What are the challenges you're facing? Are you happy? Simply giving us mood board of a lot of returning employees to the CHRO. Wherever there is an intervention required, the HR business partners reaches out and speaks to these people. These will create a lot of stickiness and ensure that these you know, programs succeed. According to uh, gender communication experts, Diobra Tanen, men speak to determine and achieve power and status. While women talk to determine and achieve connections, how can you elucidate this statement? I think that basically happens because men and women are different. They are basically two parts of the same rainbow. And it needs both the colors to create a culture and an organization which is complete, right? Uh, Men bring an agentic style of leadership to work. And this Mm -hmm. is based out of research. Women bring a communal style of uh, uh, leadership to the workplace. Agentic style of leadership is all about being assertive, being decisive, you know, having very data-driven conversations. Women will be creating organizations which are far more participative, which are far more communal. The style of uh, leadership will be maternal. They will look at creating uh, networks of relationships and both are absolutely required. Because men and women are so different, they bring different values to the place. However, unfortunately, organizationals are biased to think that leadership is defined as agentic. So, in fact, there is a research by a very famous researcher called Shane, and she says that think manager, think male. So the moment you think a manager style, you will think of assertive leadership, you will think of someone who's decisive, someone who throws data. And I I feel like one of the best ways to break it is to make the organization exposed to both styles of leadership because both are required by the organization. Men require a communal style of leadership. Women also sometimes may require an agentic style of leadership. So some of the ways in which we can break these biases which are created across the organization is really to talk about it. And this, in fact, is the entire concept of diversity, equity, and inclusion. To create diversity, to create diverse teams, to create equitable policies and infrastructure and to create a workplace which is inclusive. So it talks to all prongs of the organization. And I think it starts with a value chain. If we can hire men and women in equal quantity and which is the biggest Mm -hmm. challenge because demographics of the country show there are 50% men and 50% women. However, the workplace, those numbers drastically change because even to get a 30% diversity, which is what we are currently running at, it takes a lot of efforts. And it starts with actually ensuring that both men and women get an equal seat at the table when you're trying to hire people. And not just in functions which women are more prone to join, but if we can create a representation of women across the value chain Mm -hmm. by hiring more women, higher visibility roles. And some of the ways in which organizations do a good job of it is to create programs which hire people younger. So, you know, having management trainee programs, especially in functions like sale, where a lot of high visibility Uh, roles exist to hire them young to get them into the organization to assimilate them well to create a culture where diversity is talked about and where 
representation from both men and women is sought. When people see both styles of leadership coming in, I think is when they will uh, be able to be cognizant no, and actually receptive. It's very important because you cannot be blindly following a certain leadership style, be it of a male or a female. You need to ensure that you know there is equitable inclusion of thoughts from both Correct. the ends. Correct. So that will only create a more diverse and a more uh, you know sorted kind of an environment wherein the views are welcome from anyone and everyone. Absolutely. We also, Absolutely. Uh, you know, the share of women sitting at boards of Fortune 500 yeah. companies yeah. has doubled from 95 to, yeah. you know, 2023. Right. Okay. Right. So you can talk about uh, a certain increase of over 20% into the right. uh, share of women on the board. Yeah. But still, yeah. women workers are considered incompetent. What is, yeah. you know, what can organizations do to curb this problem? Because it isn't something that, you know, you you are hearing. Uh, we as women are experiencing it on daily basis, considering that, you know, let's say, for instance, you're going to get married, uh, then you'll have lots of responsibilities from home. How can you manage a team of, let's say, 10 people if we give you, while you have other responsibilities to cater to? So the need of work-life balance is not just a requirement from a women's end. It is equivalent, you know, a requirement on a male's end as well because he also has a yeah. family to cater to. But Correct. still, the level of incompetency is considered more in women. While women, when they're given excess of pressure and when they know they have to manage both the things at one hand, they do it perfectly fine considering that they know how to run their families as well as give time to their kids, you know. But why is the incompetency level higher, considered higher in, you know, females? I think these are biases which are very deep rooted in our society. Women are seen in more nurturing or in more roles which are more about, you know, caregiving, which are more around saying, you know, they would not be the front breadwinners of their family. Uh, there's a general there's a general perception that women will give up more easy than men. Men are the primary breadwinners and thereby they'll go all out to work harder and, you know, ensure that their deliverables are met. Women are always seen as the second breadwinners for their family and thereby it is a very strong perception held by people that they will give up easily. If you ask me, that's not true at all. We are running, like I told you, our top management is comprising of about 33% women and we have women in a, in roles which are uh, not, not the usually roles which women will hire. For example, we have a woman who's our CTO is a woman, our head of infrastructure is a woman, our head of analytics is a woman. And like I said, if you can create these role models, a lot of these barriers are broken. But to come to answer your question, how can we break this entire uh, uh, rigmarole of people's perception that women are incompetent? I would say that like, you know, that's the entire concept of inclusivity. Mm -hmm. uh, like there is a very famous saying, right? Diversity is purely representation. It's inviting people to dance. It's inviting people to a party. And inclusivity is ensuring that you invite them to dance. So getting women in across the entire value chain. So having certain policies, for example, when the final interview for certain roles and above happens, can we ensure that there is a male and a woman candidate? So there is equitable representation even at the final level. Otherwise, a lot of times by the time the final interviews happen, you have three men to choose from. So what choice will you make? You will hire, end up hiring a man only. Second is this entire concept of merit because that's very loosely defined in uh, organizations. How do you ensure that both men and women are uh, evaluated very fairly? How does your performance management ensure that every year when you're doing your fair, your distribution of ratings, when you're doing your distribution of promotions, you ensure that both men and women are given a fair share? Mm -hmm. uh, how do you ensure that your managers are a part of this entire diversity, equity and inclusion journey? What is the culture of the organization? What is the leadership stance? What is the executive signaling from the top? Do you have enough women leaders at the top so that women also under at the entry level also aspire and know that there is no glass ceiling? And they are able to work hard and break exactly, it. Exactly, yeah. This is a, I had done a research, Sugan, some time back where I had looked at factors which enable women to break the glass ceiling. And one of them was that women uh, who worked harder, actually even harder than their male counterparts, are seen more, they are more visible, and thereby they are able to break the glass ceiling. So can we create role models about out of these women and showcase them? Then I was talking to you about having women in... Uh, 
non traditional roles in sales in business development if we can create if we can hire a pipeline of entry level women and ensure that they are able to navigate across all excellence and this will be a long drawn process but if you are able to nurture these women into ensuring that they take on larger roles this perception of women being incompetent is often bro broken uh, we are in fact just starting a program which navig which helps women from a middle management into senior management category navigate this far more and women okay. needs are very different women would need coaching in influencing women will need coaching in uh, being able to put their point across men don't need that coaching mm -hmm. so identifying what are the barriers which are preventing women from rising up the organization and creating those role models last but not the least a concept called organization sponsorship and it's very critical that women have good org sponsors org sponsors mentors people who are willing to vouch for them people who are willing to call it out saying there is a specific assignment and women should go for it uh if organizations are able to look at all these concepts across the value chain they'll be successful so can i also want to make a point here that at the end of the day the biggest differentiator between people who succeed and who don't succeed is something called agency women need right. to display it a lot of times i have conversations with women who are returning from work who are uh, sorry returning to work after a break or women who are going to take on a promotion and the reality is that somewhere the social conditioning of the of the society is so high that women become less and less risk forward they become very risk averse and they don't want to right. take risks with their peers so i also appeal to all the women out there that while organizations are doing a lot like you rightly said while organizations will make all these policies someone's got to take the bull by the horns and move ahead and there exactly. i would appeal to the women that ownership is taking ownership is very necessary because until and unless you don't have faith on yourself that you know you can come back and come back with a bang then there is no point organizations organizing learning programs and induction programs to help them scale if they have a mindset that you know i've returned from break i will take apple amount of time to adjust and you know come back into the system if the organization is readily helping you to climb up another ladder then why not so the ownership is absolutely. very important i also feel absolutely so you know display that agency ask for mentors there's again a research which says that women are 40% less likely to have mentors than men but <laughs> mentors are there in the organization it's just that men seek them easily women also don't go out and network as much and networking could be both internal and external networking so there's an appeal for women to network a little bit more so it's got to be movements from both sides organization will tend to take 10 steps but women also need to take five steps ahead. of course no fair enough that that's very rightly pointed out ruhi you've actually you know taken taken this discussion on to a new stating wherein we now have responses to the problems as well and you know very beautifully you've curated you've taken out the major pain points and then given relevant solutions to it as well and i hope the people who are hearing it managers hr managers leaders who are hearing this they take some learnings from your organization as well as from your thoughts somebody who is just trying to streamline it but thank you so much ruhi for joining us for giving us time it was a pleasure for us to be speaking with you and hearing your valuable thoughts on this most welcome sugandh it was a pleasure too thank you so much you have a nice day Thank you so much Rudy thank you bye